Well, good morning and welcome to Kingston West uh, Free Methodist Church on this April the 11th. I trust that you had a, a wonderful week uh, over the, the past week and since last Sunday as you reflected and remembered on about the uh, resurrection of Christ and how that changes everything for all of us. And so I pray that that continues to be an encouragement to you. Just a, a couple of announcements uh, that I want to mention. Uh, again, these are in your bulletin for those that receive the bulletin at home. Uh, if you're watching this and you'd like to get a copy of our bulletin, you just need to contact myself uh, at the church office and uh, the information uh, are probably easier to contact us either through YouTube or Facebook with just a message and we can connect that way. Uh, just a reminder again for the uh, men, the men's group, uh, they continue to meet on Tuesday and it's a great time and, and any men out there who would like to be a part of that that aren't now, I encourage you also to touch base with Pastor Keith or with myself. And then we have uh, the Sermon on the Mount being led by uh, Pastor Debbie Hugaboom. And again, that information's in the bulletin as well as our prayer meeting every week at uh, 1.30 on Thursdays. And I think that's all that I want to mention. Um, our call to worship today comes from Psalm 34 and it's verses one to five. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Let us pray. Gracious Father, as we've gathered today to worship you, we thank you that you are present uh, with us wherever we're at, uh, that you are present there. And I just pray that as we worship you, that you will accept our worship and Lord, that through our worship, you will speak into our hearts and our lives. Encourage your people, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just one more announcement for us uh, today, and that is, is that we will be having communion at uh, the end of the service today. So uh, if you want to get some juice and some bread uh, together now, uh, we will transition, transition into that time of communion uh, following the message.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Mark in the New Testament, the third chapter, and we're reading verses 7 to 19. The first portion is entitled, Crowds Follow Jesus. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Dumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him, where he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. And the next portion is entitled, Jesus Appoints the Twelve. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Aborigines, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon of Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. May the Lord add his blessing to this word. And now let us bow our hearts together in prayer as we come before the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we bless you today. We lift our hearts in praise and thanksgiving for the love that overwhelms us. In our imperfection, Father, you teach us your perfections. In our weakness, you show your strength. In our times of so little, you appear to us with your strength and identify with us that you are so infinite in love and mercy and grace. Today, as we are gathered, wherever we are, Father, I just pray that the words of Scripture that we read, that the hymns that we sing together, and Father, for this word that Pastor Stephen will share with us today, might, Father, be used as a tool of mercy to help each one of us to identify any areas in our life where weakness may reside, so that you may heal that. Any areas, Father, that we need your healing touch, that we would call upon your name. Father, all of us are in need in one way or another, and yet we look in through our community, and we see so many that are strained and struggling. And for them, Father, we just pray that your grace would abound. Father, may they know that the love of Christ that we talk about from week to week here actually exists and that you are waiting for them to call upon your name so that you might enrich their lives, that you might bring answers where they have questions, and so that they may be strengthened in you as a result of their relying upon you for each step they take. Father, we thank you that one day others took time to prepare a way so that we might come to that place to call upon your name. And so it is today as this program goes out. I pray, Father, whether it's believer or someone today that is listening that has never made that choice, that they would call out to you and ask for your mercy, ask for your forgiveness. And Father, that you may use this opportunity to glorify yourself, to change lives in a real and purposeful way for your glory and for the greatness and expansion of the kingdom of God. Thank you for hearing our prayers today. Thank you for what you do and, and continue to do, even when we don't know to ask. And we will give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for you alone are worthy. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our gospel reading today uh, comes from John. We've had actually two gospel readings. Pastor Keith just read to us from Mark. And this text comes from John, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 35 to 51. John's disciples follow Jesus. 
<clears throat> the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and had followed him, or followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked up and sa at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. May the Lord speak to us through this, his word. Well, today we're going to begin a new series of messages entitled The Master Plan of Evangelism. Now, you might be thinking, that title is so familiar. I think there's a book with the same title. And you would be correct. Robert E. Coleman wrote the book, The Master Plan of Evangelism. 
And in his book, he takes a very practical look at the life of Jesus and how he set the example for us to follow regarding evangelism. And for this series, I'm going to use his book as my main resource, and uh, I've added my own stories and thoughts uh, to personalize the series. However, I want to give credit where credit is due. Some of you may even have a copy or two of that book at home, and you might like to read the equivalent chapter each week uh, as I preach through that. So evangelism. The mere mention of that word, you know, it can stir up all kinds of thoughts and emotions in people. Some people, they get excited. Some feel inadequate. And for some, it brings fear into their mind. And I can relate to many of these emotions. So let me begin by sharing with you one of my failures. I was 19 years old. And I was in the process of moving back to Ontario after living in Calgary. I was a fairly new Christian at the time, and I had just finished a year of Bible college. I was traveling by myself, and I had never before picked up a hitchhiker. Just after I'd gone through the city of Winnipeg, I passed a young couple that was hitchhiking. And right after I went past them, I really felt that the Lord wanted me to pick them up and that I was to share my faith with them. Instantly, fear settled in, and I said, no. I reasoned that picking up hitchhikers was an unsafe practice. Plus, I'd already passed them, and it was just too hard to turn around and go back. So I continued on. To redeem myself a little, I said that I would pick them up if I saw them again. Of course, they were behind me by this point. Much to my surprise, though, about an hour later, guess who was standing at the side of the road with their thumbs out? God said, there they are. Now, please stop and give them a ride. Once again, I argued back saying, no, I can't do this. And I drove right on by. Then I began to feel incredibly guilty. So once again, I said, okay, Lord, if I see them again, I will definitely stop hoping deep down that I would never see them again. And I was just on my way out of Dryden, Ontario. I came around a corner and guess who was there? I couldn't believe it because I had not stopped driving since the last time I saw them. Panic set in again and the Lord said, please stop and pick them up. But I drove by once more. The Lord then reminded me of my promises, so I turned around and I went back and picked them up. It turned out that they were traveling almost as far as I was going. They were going to southeastern Ontario, somewhere in this region, and I was going to southwestern Ontario. And they were only 16 years old, this couple, and they had run off together about six months earlier. She came from a large family in what sounded like, as I recall, a very unpleasant home life. Uh, he came from a broken home. They tried to make a go of things in Edmonton, uh, but he couldn't find work there. And when their money ran out, they had to head for home again. He was hoping that his dad would take them in because she was scared to go home. You know, I really felt for them, and I, I tried to help them out as best I could. And I knew that I was to share the hope and the joy that Jesus could bring into their lives, but I was terrified for some reason of doing that. And to this day, I regret that I let them out of the truck without sharing the gospel message with them. I had failed God in a major way, and I've prayed for that couple over the years, that God would bring someone into their lives that would help them to see Jesus as the answer to their struggles. I've asked God to forgive me for letting him down when he called upon me to speak. So maybe you can identify with my story in your own way. Evangelism. The word tends to make a lot of Christians squirm or even tremble with fear. Sharing our faith in this day and age can be a scary thing. I mean, we live in a secular society that rejects specifically Christianity. Yet not all that long ago, Christianity was the norm and people talked much more freely about their personal faith. 
Today, there's a lot more risk involved in sharing. Being accepted has become a major part for most people in life. We want others to accept us, not to reject us. Therefore, sharing our faith in our society carries with it an ever-increasing risk of being rejected. So what are we to do? Well, we could brainwash ourselves like some cults do so that rejection is seen as a blessing. Somehow this doesn't sound too appealing to me. We could go to an online uh, bookstore or check out Right Now Media where we can probably find thousands of how-to books or video teachings on evangelism, many of which would be a good resource. We could take an, uh, an, an in-your-face confrontational approach and condemn people living in sin. A good preacher, you know, in the day could literally scare people into the kingdom. Some people, I must admit, need such a shock to get them thinking about where their life is taking them. But today, this approach seems to turn more people away uh, than anything else. Another approach could be a very passive one, trying to live the good Christian life and hoping that others will notice and ask us why we're different. Or you could say that the pastor's job is to do evangelism and bring new people into the church. True, that's part of the pastor's job. However, that's how the people outside the church see it as well. The pastor's just doing his job. What they want to see is genuine people from within the church that care and are excited about what God is doing in their lives. So we come to the question, what are we supposed to do? How do we go about evangelizing and reaching our communities today? Jesus instructed us to go and make disciples of all nations. In this day and age, we are bombarded with many ideas as to the best way to accomplish this. Some of them, again, being great ideas, especially uh, when you're dealing with today's cultural climate. But our starting point in looking at evangelism is found in and through the life of Jesus. He's the one who commanded us in Matthew 28 when he came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus is saying to his disciples and to you and I, this is your mission to go. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus reveals to us the how he set the example. The master teacher has revealed for us timeless principles of how to go. Now, just maybe... We, the church, should be more interested in rediscovering Jesus' strategy for evangelism rather than trying to discover new ones. Today, we're going to begin by looking at Jesus' method for evangelism. He revealed his method very early in his ministry. Um, just, read, just read from John chapter 1, verses 35 to 51, and in this text, we see that his method for winning people to God would be founded in people. He looked for people who would follow him, who were teachable, and who would continue his mission after he returned to the Father. Jesus was looking for people who were willing to learn. Our first impressions of the disciples are really not all that great. They appear to be a ragtag group. They were not well-educated, and none of them really held high-ranking positions. They were just everyday people, just like you and I. However, all followers of Jesus can attest that these disciples have had a lasting impact on our world. And as we investigate the Gospels, we will find that there were, they were teachable. Even though they may have been a little slow to comprehend, and their judgments maybe were off a little, they were honest men, willing to confess their needs, and with the exception of Judas, the traitor, they had big hearts. 
the bottom line is that Jesus can use anyone who wants to be used. It doesn't matter if your hair is gray or you use a cane or you feel as though the world doesn't want you anymore. Jesus says, come, I can use you. I will make you fishers of men. It doesn't matter if you're a teenager or younger and you feel as though the world doesn't listen to you, your dreams and your ideas. Jesus says, come, I can use you. I will make you fishers of men. It doesn't matter if you fall someplace in between. God is looking for anyone who has a teachable heart and desires to be used by him to make a difference in our world. And as we look at Jesus' method for evangelism, we will also notice that even though he had many disciples that followed him, he made it a point to select only 12. In Luke 6, 12 to 16, it says, One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphetheus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. See, this was the wisdom in his method for evangelizing the world. It was to concentrate on a few to pour his energy into the twelve. One cannot transform the world unless individuals are transformed. He kept the group small so that he could work effectively with them. We know that Jesus had others who followed him and became effective workers in the kingdom, such as the, the gospel writers Luke and Mark and uh, James, the brother of Jesus. But this select group, which he called apostles, had special privileges. The scripture gives evidence as well to yet an even smaller selection of individuals that were chosen by Jesus from the twelve. They were Peter, James, and John. It was only these privileged few that were invited into the sick room of Jairus' daughter, and they were the only ones allowed to see his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. And it was this group of men that waited nearest to him when, they, when he prayed at Gethsemane. Jesus devoted his life and staked his entire ministry on the ones he appointed as apostles. As their lives were transformed, they in turn would go out and transform others. You know, when a single kernel of wheat is planted, it dies, but it transforms into more kernels. Now, it doesn't produce enough to feed, a wor feed the world, but it continues to multiply as each new seed dies and produces more. Now, I've used this uh, illustration in the past, but let me share it again. It's called the power of one. Current world population... Uh, is almost 8 billion people. Now, if Billy Graham preached every day and a 1,000 people gave their lives to Jesus every single day, how many years do you think it would take him to reach the entire world for Jesus? Because we would look at that and say, that's pretty spectacular, right? A 1,000 people every day when he preached would give their lives to Jesus. But it would take him 21,917 years to reach all 8 billion people. Now, what if I went out and I invested my life into one person for a whole year, and they came to know Jesus during that time? And then in year two, we each find one person and we do the same for an entire year. How many years would it take to reach the entire population of the world. Sounds like a pretty slow process, doesn't it? It would actually only take 33 to 34 years. This was Jesus' purpose to invest himself in a few that would in turn invest themselves in a few and eventually the world would be transformed for the kingdom. 
This didn't mean that Jesus ignored the masses. He continued to do more than any person could be expected to do in meeting the needs of the multitudes. He fed them when they were hungry. He healed the sick. He cast out the demons. He blessed their children. He showed a genuine and sincere concern for the needs of the people. Jesus was very successful at ministering to the masses, so much so that the people wanted to take him by force and make him king, John 6, 15. Even the leaders of the Pharisees admitted that the world had gone after him in John 11, verse 47, and chapter 12, verse 19. The problem with this is that Jesus could have had the whole world at his feet through the display of his power. However, that's not ministry as he saw it. What was important to Jesus was a person who was transformed in their heart, soul, and mind. Jesus had compassion for the people and their needs, but he was more concerned for the healing of their souls. To reach that inner dimension of a person where they will surrender or die to their old self and are transformed was not something that could be done in a mass setting. This type of change comes in a close, intimate relationship with a few, and it takes time. That's why Jesus would take his disciples and leave the multitudes behind. This is why at mass evangelistic crusades, it becomes so incredibly crucial that there are people who are willing to help disciple those that have made a decision to follow Jesus in a crusade. The person who has just given their life to Jesus needs to be discipled. They need to know what following Jesus looks like in your life and in mine. And you know, it's very sad, a very sad reality that with all the work and planning of such crusades, those that make a decision for Jesus at them are most often left on their own with no help, and they just fade into the woodwork. I think Pastor Keith would attest to this as he spent time helping uh, plan crusade events with uh, Steve Wingfield Ministries. There's substantial investment ahead of time equipping local leaders and churches and people to equip them to disciple new believers. The problem is that we as evangelical Christians have somehow gotten it in our heads that the initial commitment is all that matters, and we leave the convert to find their own way. There would have been no point in Jesus calling the masses to repent when there was no one to lead them in the way. Jesus was not out to impress the crowds, but to usher in a new kingdom. This meant he needed people who could lead the masses. In Canada today, evangelism, I would say, uh, is at an all-time low. How do I know this? because evangelical churches everywhere are experiencing, for the most part, decline. And where we do find growth, we often find it's just a shifting of the saints. My intent is not to sound judgmental in this or pile a heap of guilt on us, but I just don't think we're doing very well in the commission to go and make disciples. So where do we go? <coughs> How do we in Kingston and the surrounding area get ourselves out of this rut? We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and we need to follow his example and his commission to go and make disciples. And we start right where God has placed us. Or to personalize it even more, where God has placed you. In your neighborhood, your places of employment, in your social circles. Today, over 2,000 years later, Jesus is looking for the same thing. He's looking for people who are willing to learn. He's seeking out people like you and I that are teachable. And if I'm to follow the example of Jesus left for me as your pastor, this is how I would see it unfolding. I'm to prayerfully seek out a few, as Jesus did, that I can pour myself into. I seek to disciple them and develop their leadership so that they can in turn do the same, at the same time not neglecting the needs of the rest of the congregation. 
for those of you here who are mature in your faith, who have been discipled, you are being called to do the same. Some of you are already doing this. Maybe for others, you need to answer the call and begin to step out in faith and take action. Pray that the Holy Spirit would bring someone into your life that you can pour your life into and disciple them. Maybe you can adopt a family or a person from outside the church. You can begin to pray for them and establish and build a friendship with them. I believe that if we would use the principle of one by praying for, befriending, and investing ourselves in those that the Lord brings into our lives, we will see some great things happen in our midst. This is evangelism, people reaching out to other people. We are Jesus' method for evangelism. He selected us as his people to go and make disciples, and he has left for us his example to follow. So as we embark on this journey over the next uh, few weeks, looking at the master's plan for evangelism, I would challenge you to prayerfully seek the Lord and ask him to bring one person or, or one family into your life that you can minister to. And I'm confident of one thing. If you ask him for this with a sincere heart, he will do just that. And I would guess that for some of you, you've already had a name pop into your mind. Pray for them. Pour your life into them and see what happens. Let's pray. Gracious Father, again, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus. And we are thankful that he has laid out the perfect plan, the best way to reach those that are lost, those that are searching for something more in this life. And we know that you are the answer. So today we ask you to put someone in our mind that we can begin to pray for, somebody that we can reach out to, Give us opportunities to do so. And Lord, we are your servants. We desire to learn. We know we haven't arrived. That we're not perfect in all that we do. But, but Lord, you desire to use us just the way we are. And you desire to work in us to change us often when we're helping others. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we'll transition into a time of communion. The invitation, you who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, in who intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and, and walking in His holy ways, draw near with faith and take His holy sacraments to your comfort, and humbly kneeling, make your honest confession to Almighty God. Now please join me in the general confession. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we confess that we have sinned, and we are deeply grieved as we remember the wickedness of our past lives. We have sinned against you, your holiness and your love, and we deserve only your indignation and anger. We sincerely repent, and we are genuinely sorry for all the wrongdoing and every failure to do the things we should. Our hearts are grieved, and we acknowledge that we are hopeless without your grace. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us, cleanse us, give us strength to serve and please you in newness of life, and to honor and praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you join me as we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who with great mercy has promised forgiveness to all who turn to you with hearty repentance and true faith, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from our sins. Make us strong and faithful in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And again, please join me in the calling. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are opened, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now the Sanctus. It is always right and proper and our moral duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all of the inhabitants of heaven, we honor and adore your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, let's say together, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, Heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord, most high. Amen. The Prayer of Spiritual Communion. We do not come to this your table, O merciful Father, with self-confidence and pride, trusting in our own righteousness, but we trust in your great and many mercies. We are not worthy to gather the crumbs from under your table, but you, O Lord, are unchanging in your mercy, and your nature is love. Grant us, therefore, God of mercy, God of grace, so to eat at this your table, that we may receive in spirit and in truth the body of your dear Son, and being washed and cleansed through his most precious blood, we may evermore live in him and he in us. Amen. And let us pray the consecration of the elements. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who gave in love your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who by his sacrifice offered once for all did provide a full, perfect, and sufficient atonement for the sins of the whole world, we come now to your table in obedience to your Son, Jesus Christ, who in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we humbly ask, and grant that we, receiving this bread and this cup, as he commanded and in the memory of his passion and death, we partake of his most blessed body and blood. And the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful.
And now as we go today, uh, receive this benediction as you go. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be yours now and forevermore. Amen.